Okay, I guess that's it. We can get started. Um, the topic of today's presentation is about kind of about the state of audio in Linux. How did we get where we are at the moment? Um, where are we at the moment and where are we going in the future? And of course, uh, the question uh, of the title, are we in a golden age right now? And is it coming to an end? Uh, my name is Lars Peter Clausen. I work for Analog Devices, where I, among other things, work on audio drivers for audio codecs. Uh, so the agenda for today is, well, we will start with the history of audio, not just audio on Linux. Uh, we will look at the major transitions in both hardware as well as software, and we will look at what drove those transitions, because major transitions usually don't just happen because but there's usually a reason triggering it, and we'll look at the reasons why, what triggered them and um, maybe what we've learned from those transitions. Then we will look at the present, what is the current situation. As I said, are we in a golden age? Um, and then as the last step, look in the future, what's coming up next, which transitions are going to come, um, and how are we going to deal with them, how are we going to handle them. Um, but before we start, I quickly want to um, mention the concept of interdependent with modular um, and you find this uh, in architectures not just software and ha uh, hardware architectures but architectures of systems in general can be kind of grouped into interdependent architectures and modular architectures and um, the interdependent architecture you you don't you have a module or something like a device which provides a function, but there is no clear separation of different submodules. Everything is fluent. Um, the different parts, the different submodules know about each other and they know about the internals, um, which of course creates dependencies between them. If you want to upgrade one part, you have to upgrade the other part. Um, in contrast to this, there's the modular uh, architecture which is clearly separated into different submodules which have clearly defined interfaces over which those submodules communicate and which means you can easily change exchange parts uh, or submodules without having to update all those other submodules um, in the same system and but one, one downside of this is that you're, of course, constrained by the interface. You have to comply to the interface. If you're not complying to the interface, things no longer work. And um, if, if you look at um, modular versus interdependent, there's no clear, this is better than the other one. It all depends on the environment you're working in uh, and, and the kind of application you want to run. But the concept of interdependent versus modular goes like a red line through this whole presentation. And I'm not necessarily going to mention or going to point out, hey, this is intermodular, this is, uh, sorry, this is interdependent, this is a modular, uh, simply because you can't always sell. There's many different hybrid states in between. But what I want you to do is, uh, as we go along through the presentation, look at things and think about, is this more modular, is this more interdependent, and maybe could we change it to be more modular or more interdependent and how would this affect the system as a whole? So let's start with the history. Um, because as they say, to understand the future, you first have to understand the history. How did we get um, to where we are right now? And uh, we will really just focus on the major transitions and we will focus on Linux and on ALSA, not so much on the other things. And uh, we will key about, we will not really talk about the mining transitions like from mono to stereo, because those are gradual things that just happen. Um, but for the major transitions, there's usually a reason. So humble beginnings, um, in the 1980s, roughly, there's the emergence of kind of like the personal computer um, space. The Apple II is released, IBM PC is released. And what you can find in those systems is the so-called PC speaker, sometimes known as the beeper. And it was really part of the really first PC, um, which was released in 1981. And what you could do with this device was really limited. It kind of has like two states, can be on and off. And um, by switching it on and off at a certain frequency, you can create a tone. 
Um, but it was very limited to, for example, only a specific volume. Well, you can only have like it's either off or it's on, but you can't have any intermediate states. So um, people use this. Um, some games use this, like to play, I don't know, a victory melody, like beep, 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 or something like this. Um, and, well, implemented, those were implemented as either like a magnetic speaker that can be turned on and off, or a piezoelectric plate in a more modern system. And uh, on Linux, interestingly, those are supported in the, not in the audio subsystem, but in the input framework, um, primarily because, uh, probably because input predates uh, audio, and this device is so simple that it can be used for, uh, it's often used for giving feedback, like if you enter a wrong command, you get a beep, uh, still to this day, and um, this is what is mainly used. And um, what we have to remember in those days, the CPUs are like really, really slow, we're running at like five megahertz or something. So uh, you couldn't really play back complex audio wave files anyway. Um, but eventually people wanted to have more features. This was primarily driven by the game industry. Um, so uh, probably many of you remember the Sound Blaster. Uh, this was the more or less first widespread consumer sound card, um, which was released in 1989, the first version. There was actually another sound card of which the Sound Blaster was a clone, which was released two years earlier. But the Sound Blaster had some additional features, was otherwise fully compatible, and the other company uh, already went bankrupt three years after the Sound Blaster was released. And these sound cards back in those days were primarily synthesizer-based. So you would program it to generate some kind of sound effect rather than like we have today where we just play back a wave file. Um, but the Sound Blaster, um, the differentiating feature of the Sound Blaster had was actually it had one mono 8-bit PCM channel. And um, this, this essentially made it the de facto sound card for consumers. Um, and applications like games or other uh, like audio media players were written against the interface of the Sound Blaster, which means other hardware manufacturers which wanted to use the same interface, uh, which wanted to enter the market, had to support the same interface, had to make themselves compatible to the Sound Blaster interface. So basically you had the first standard for uh, audio sound cards. And then of course later on they added lots of new features, uh, was made 16-bit, um, people at some point wanted to play back, like listen to maybe music, but at the same time get notifications, you got email and so on. So what they added was mixers for multiple streams and hardware and so on. So it's, it's slowly progressing, getting more features and more and more features. Um, so the next step, audio and Linux. In the beginning, there was the open sound system called OSS, which was the default uh, in Linux until version 2. Point, well, it was a default in version 2.4. Um, you had the DS, Dev DSP interface, and it was really simple. Um, to play back audio, you would just use a normal write. You would treat it like a normal file interface. To capture audio, you would read. And there were a couple of IRCTLs for management tasks, like um, changing the volume and so on. But one of the major drawbacks uh, that became a problem quite early on is that as you can see here, it's just Def DSP, not like Def, Def DSP 0, Def DSP 1. So it can only be one sound card per system. And there were some other um, major restrictions. And uh, it's, it's still supported on today's Linux OS S, um, mostly through emulation, through other, but there are actually still, I think, 15 native OS S drivers which have seen uh, pretty much like no changes in the last years, but they're still around in case somebody is using it. And most distributions actually don't chip them anymore. So it's practically it's dead, but we keep it around uh, because we don't break user space ABI and in case somebody's still using it. And um, as long as the code is not really like becoming a burden, it, there's no need to remove it, but eventually it will probably be removed from the kernel, especially since there's user space emulation available. 
and um, most distributions make use of this user space emulation rather than kernel space emulation. Um, but what we should mention maybe is that OSS is still used on, on the BSDs, for example. Um, the next, next step then is ALSA, which is the main focus of this presentation, um, the advanced learning sound architecture. Um, ALSA was first developed, or as the ALSA development actually started quite early on, um, I think 1996 or so, and it was developed out of tree, out of the mainline Linux kernel in parallel while OSS existed in the mainline tree. And um, the first official release was in 1998. And, um, but there were some issues with OSS, as I already said, in terms of features, what it could support, but there was a, uh, the company who created OSS decided to make core, core components of OSS closed source, which didn't really go well with some developers of the Linux kernel. And I think this was the final reason why OSS was replaced with ALSA, which was done during the 2.5 development cycle in uh, 2004. And even the first release of ALSA had many, many of the major concepts that we still see today in, in ALSA. And uh, the basic architecture looks like this. So ALSA is not just limited to the kernel. Um, it's, it's split between the kernel and the user space. There's a user space component and the kernel space component, um, which I personally think is a good idea in general for hardware abstraction layers because the interface or the boundary be between kernel space and user space um, is very restricted in what you can do and which makes, makes it cumbersome to use for end users. So you want to provide some kind of layer on top of it in user space, which simplifies things. And ALSA did this right from the start. And all applications are really developed against this user space API and uh, not against the kernel space API. And um, another feature or another core concept of ALSA is that it, um, at the kernel level, it only describes the hardware as accurately as possible. It says, okay, this hardware can support two channel and maybe 16 bit, and this other hardware can support two channel, four channel, and 16 bit and 32 bit. There's no emulation, um, like resampling or mixing inside the kernel. Um, this is all handled in user space. And uh, also, also implies uh, a user a server client architecture. Um, which communicate which is a well-defined interface. The, the, the server offers audio services, audio playback, audio capture services, and the client uses this. Um, but this is, again, not limited to drivers and end applications, but uh, also uses a module pl plug-in architecture. And there are some plugins which can be stacked on top of each other, where a plug-in is a client to the underlying layer, but the server to the upper layers. And this was how, for example, mixing was implemented in the early days. You had a plugin in user space, which would uh, talk to the hardware driver, then implement mixing, and on top of that, provide an interface to user space applications. And um, yeah, uh, and, and Organized from an organization perspective, ASA is um, split into, ASA has a top level component, which is called a sound card. There can be many sound cards in the system, not like OSS, where there's only one. And uh, a sound card has so called devices, which can be really anything that implements some kind of function. Can be PCM playback, can be capture, can be um, mixer, can be MIDI, can be timer. Um, in this presentation, we will really not be talking about those two, more about those over here. And um, each device can have sub-devices which specify specific endpoints in this device. Like if you have mixing capabilities in hardware, your PCM device would have two sub-devices. Um, and this is what you typically see on a modern sound system, like on your laptop, on your desktop, maybe. You have a sound card, you have one playback uh, device, one capture device, and then a mixer device. And what also also introduced early on is the concept of uh, controls. And those controls were used for configuring the hardware. 
um, rather than like it was done with OSS using uh, device-specific IOCTLs, for example. And there are different types of controls that also implements. And there's a volume control, and the volume controls typically also provide uh, a gain table. So, you know, if you change this volume by so much, this corresponds to a change of so many dB in your uh, sound output. Um, there are switch controls for turning things on and off, like muting an output stream and the enumeration controls, uh, which are primarily used for, for routing. Like um, if you have an input and you can only, and you have two microphones, you can only record from one microphone at a time, you would use an enumeration control, which allows you to switch between those two microphones. And um, each, each control also has a name, which is used to uniquely identify it. And um, in the beginning, there was a definition of a standard naming scheme. You can see this over here. Um, there's like headphone volumes, speaker volumes, playback master volume. Um, and drivers were encouraged to follow the standard naming scheme so applications could figure out which, um, which function this control controls, actually. Um, but as we will see later on, uh, as things grew more complex, um, not so many drivers are actually following the naming scheming convention anymore, or actually there's so much more functionality which is not recorded in the, in the, in the naming scheme. Um, so drivers just come up with their own thing, and this means, of course, that user space applications no longer are capable of uh, knowing what this control does and need intimate knowledge about the card itself, about the sound card itself, um, and can't work like in a generic way. Uh, another very important part of ALSA is the so-called constraint system. And uh, I think this is actually the most differentiating feature of ALSA. Um, and the constraint system is used, or if, if you have written, if you have ever written an ALSA application, the constraint system is probably what you've looked at and thought, what, what is this? I, I just, like, I want to play back some WAV files and I do not want to, like, uh, send a spaceship to the moon or something because it's if, if you look at it it's it's really complicated to use but it's also extremely powerful and um, the way it works is that you start out with a configuration space configuration space includes all possible configurations that the device can have like uh, this is kind of like a simplified example you have a device that has to, uh, has the option of either playing back audio with one or two channels and at 16K or 32K sample rate. Um, but it cannot play back two channels at 32K, at a 32K rate for whatever reason. Um, but if you initially query the audio state, you will get this box because the configuration space is kind of like a boundary box about around all possible configurations. And then you go, or the application goes through a negotiation phase with the driver, which slowly refining what it actually wants to do. For example, the, the application can say, okay, I only want to play back one channel. What uh, rates can you offer me for this channel? And then the bounding box shrinks. And if the application had said, okay, I want to have two channels, which rates can you offer me for two channels? We would only have the bounding box around this. And um, this is, extre as I said, it's extremely powerful, but it's also, uh, if you just want to play back a single audio file, it's very complicated to use. And um, we'll get to this a bit later, but I think, so I think this is the main, main differentiating factor which has allowed ALSA to be very versatile, to be used in professional as well as uh, consumer audio. Um, but one overlook was maybe in the beginning that people wanted a simpler interface. Not everybody cared about maximum performance because this really allows you to extract maximum performance from your hardware. Um, well, but we will get to this later. So the next, next transition in, um, in the audio hardware world is reducing cost. Um, CPU processing power became a lot, lot more powerful. We are now no longer running at five megahertz, but rather 500 megahertz. So the, the CPU power that's required for audio processing is um, 
now relatively small compared to the overall available processing power. And then some clever folks came up with the idea, well, we can save a lot of money if we uh, remove all this hardware from our sound card and just do it in software. Um, so the hardware was greatly simplified during this transition. There are no more synthesizers, no more mixers, just one stream, one input stream, one output stream, uh, and that's it. And the features are moved to software and emulated in software. Um, what also happened during this phase is uh, the standardization of audio interfaces. Um, the first kind of standard that was implemented is the so-called Audio Codec 97 standard, which is um, named this way because, well, it was uh, really introduced in 1997 and it's the standard specifying audio codecs. And um, one concept that came up with is it splits cleanly splits things into a controller device and a codec device. And there's a clear interface between the controller and the codec. And in addition to what it is, is to, in the, uh, sorry, and, and on this bus, um, that can be transport for audio data as well as for control data for making changes like changing the volume. So it's all handled over the same bus. And it's well standardized how this bus works. So anybody can basically come and implement a codec if they know how to make a codec, and anybody can come and make a controller if they know how to make a controller, and it will just hopefully magically work if you put those two together. In the reality, it wasn't like this. Um, if you have a standard and multiple implementers of the standard, you will always end up with, um, well, slight, slight variations, slight incompatibilities, and um, so, but in, in the soft, it, it really simplified things for the software world because it meant we can write a single driver, single driver which basically takes care of all those devices. And then if a device is not fully standard compliant, we add a small quirk or patch to the driver which takes care of the device specific incompatibilities. Because uh, the other thing the standard des uh, specified was a standard register map. Um, there was a standard register layout specified in the standard, um, and all drivers and applications could rely on it being there. And what was also part, like, if you want to change the sample rate, it would always be done in the same register, whereas with older sound hardware, every sound hardware had, his own, had their own register. And what it also did, which is, uh, I think, really important, is it um, added the ability to have discoverable features so there was one register, two registers, which specified which functions are implemented uh, by this device. And the standard does not, did not specify you have to implement all these functions, but left it open to the codec implementer which, which functions they uh, thought were relevant. Um, but AC97 was also quite limited, and it quickly became clear that, for example, vendor, extension, vendor extensions are necessary. In the beginning, there was a reserved set of registers for vendor, vendor extensions. Um, but as, as vendors ran out of this vendor extension registers, they just ended up reusing um, standardized registers. And at this point, everything breaks down because you no longer have a standardized interface of everybody uses a standard register map, but applies their own meaning to the specific <laughs> registers. And it was also uh, limited in, in terms of audio performance. In the beginning, it was only 16-bit, later extended to 20 bits. Um, but it was also a maximum of six channels and 96 kilohertz. So um, we'll see this in a moment, but it was rather quickly replaced again. Um, but it's still around today in some niche applications which requirements are enough. And the other thing that came around the same, around the same time frame is the USB audio class. Um, so the, US, the U, USB universal, the universal bus was basically uh, the idea to standardize um, well, things like keyboards, mouse, but it's also audio. And uh, the standard defines so-called device classes. And one device class is, is for audio. It's actually the first one, device class one as the device class for audio, and it defines how a USB device, which wants to be audio sound card, has to behave, um, which allowed people, or allowed, yeah, allowed people to write a standard driver, which covers, again, all USB devices, rather than having to write one driver for one device. Of 
course, again, there were some quirks, not all devices were uh, specific, but it was handled in a similar way uh, uh, as to AC97. And um, yeah, the, the first USB standard was released in 1998. It was uh, interestingly called 1.1, not really 1.0, because nobody used 1.0. Uh, and it took us around four years to add support for audio device class. Um, which I guess is in part down to it took the kernel a while to implement USB at all. Uh, so now we are at a point where the hardware has been greatly reduced and um, we have to emulate things in software. And um, people came up with the concept of sound servers. And uh, I call this period the sound server wars because what, what happened really is, is um, that different desktop environments adopted different sound server solutions. It was, for example, the ARTSD, which, was, uh, which came from the KDE project, and there was the ESD, which was used by the Enlightenment uh, desktop environment and GNOME. And each sound server, of course, implemented their own client API and applications had to choose which client API they have to use. So you have like half of the Linux desktop applications work with this one sound server and half of the Linux desktop applications work with this other sound server. So naturally you have to run both sound servers on your system, but your sound card only supports one stream. So only one sound server can be active at the same time. If you want to use a KDE application that plays audio at the same time as a GNOME application that plays audio, bad luck. So it's not really a good solution if your solution kind of like, if your solution uh, includes that only 50% of things are working, it's, it's not really a solution, it's more of a problem. Um, and, but luckily, um, uh, Pulse Audio came along um, the development actually started in 2004, which is just two years after uh, ARSA had been integrated into the upstream Linux kernel. Um, and it was also quickly adopted by distributions, shipping, ev shipping as early as 2007 with Fedora and 2008 on Ubuntu as the default sound server. And, and the one thing that Pulse Audio really did right, which set it apart from everybody else's, provided compatibility layers like application that was written against the ESD sound server would still function with Pulse Audio. Application that was written against the raw ARS interface would function with Pulse Audio. Application that was written against ARTS uh, would function with Pulse Audio. So this was really a unified solution and won at the war. And um, there were, of course, some issues in the beginning with Pulse Audio. Many, many people complain to, or complained about it, and some still continue to complain about it today, but uh, it's, it's always easy to complain if you don't remember what a mess it was before, and I personally think that Pulse Audio is probably the best thing that happened to the Linux audio system in the last 10 years, uh, because it, uh, it uh, resulted in things simply working right now. Maybe not at the start, but took it a few years, but now things are essentially just working. And with this approach of uh, arts and ESD and so on, it would never have worked. And the other thing that Pulse Audio did, it offered a simplified audio API. So if you want to write a simple audio application, you no longer have to use the complicated <coughs> ALSA API, you can use Pulse Audio. And uh, this helped for application adoption for Pulse Audio as well. And when we look at Pulse Audio today, it's, it's really a modern sound server and many innovations, at least on Linux, on a Linux desktop, uh, in terms of audio came from Pulse Audio. It's like timer-based scheduling, which allows us to have low latency and power saving at the same time, because usually you have to choose between one of the two with more traditional approaches. But this allows both of them. You have per application volumes, uh, Pulse Audio is network capable. You can play audio on one machine and stream it over the network and put it, uh, output it on the speaker on the other one. Like you have maybe, maybe a dedicated media PC and want to play back audio on your laptop. You set it up so it streams the audio to your media PC and it comes out of your speakers. And it's also uh, multi-user capable, which means like um, one person can log out uh, of, or can lock the screen, another person can log in, and um, automatically all the multimedia streams of the person who logged out will be muted and the other person can use the audio hardware with, with more traditional approaches. If an audio application was running, even if it was running in the background, it 
uh, would basically hog the audio interface and nobody else could use it. And also it's like Bluetooth integration, so lots of stuff going on there. And these days, uh, none of the other sound servers are around anymore. And Pulse Audio is the default on all, sorry, on all major distributions. Another thing that happened around the same time is uh, embedded started to become more important, more powerful. Um, and this is when we saw the introduction of uh, ASOC, also for system on a chips, which was merged in 2006, actually on the October 6th. So basically today is the 10 year anniversary of uh, ASOC being integrated into the upstream kernel. Um, and what the uh, innovation that ASOC did is it split things into two different categories from a framework perspective. Uh, it split things into a platform device, which usually took care of the DMA, uh, which is copying data from memory to the audio pipeline or the other direction. Um, the next component was the CPU die, which is, represents the audio controller, which back in the day was mostly either I2S or AC97. Today it's sometimes also SPDIF. And the third component was the audio codec, which was an external component which did not live on the SOC, which was connected to the audio controller through the standard audio interface. And um, on, the, on the codec, you typically implemented all the mixing and controls and stuff, um, all the, and, and the volumes as well. And what ASOC required you to do if you want to create an ASOC sound card is you need to write a so-called fabric or card uh, driver which combi uh, combines different components into one sound card. In addition, you need to define the fabric, like which speakers are connected to which parts on the codec, microphones and so on. Um, and this greatly um, allowed uh, reusability because in the old days you basically um, rewrote or if you, if you had similar components uh, on different sound cards, you just copied it over and did something similar there. So now we have the ability to really share code between different sound cards which are made of, of the same components. And the other thing that ASOC did, it uh, introduced uh, dynamic audio power man, George Deppham. And uh, this is a graph of all the power relevant nodes in the system and uh, that allows really fine-grained uh, power tracking because on an embedded system you always want to be in the lowest power state and with uh, older sound cards if you were lucky what they did if you if you open the uh, playback device they power everything up and if you close it again they power everything down but in this case you really have fine-grained tracking of what needs to be powered up in some cases you don't need to power up all the amplifiers because for example only one audio path is active and Dappen allowed this to track this and um, Dappen also introduced a kind of like a cross device uh, interface for managing this so different different codecs could communicate over Dappen with, with each other um, which is again great for reuse, reusability um, yeah so let's, let's quickly talk about more modern hardware um, as I said, AC97, uh, people quickly figured out it's uh, well, not working out so well. So it's a successor was introduced, it's high definition audio, and it's, it's quite similar, um, but it made some, some major changes. Um, the way things are organized in, in AC97, you had a flat reg register map, and uh, here it's more organized in a hier hierarchical function groups like a root node and the many sub nodes so it's much more extensible because vendors can just add a new node if they have to and um, but otherwise it follows a similar scheme that you have to split between the host controller and the codec and uh, what HDA also introduced is uh, it was more or less self-describing there was a table in the BIOS which described which pin was or which input port on your device was connected to which pin like which speaker was connected to which pin on the, on the codec, which eventually allowed to greatly simplify the HDA driver um, by parsing this table and then have just one driver that works for everything. Of course, again, quirks are necessary for some exceptions. Um, yeah, but 
it's, it's really just in the kernel there's really just one driver which handles all of those devices like every laptop every desktop and it was later also used for things like HDMI or display port uh, audio output and yeah yeah so and the, and the other thing that happens is uh, mobile became a lot more important um, these days mobile is very multimedia, multimedia driven um, you want to play back audio, video on your device while being on the road. And audio really has become a differentiating factor. Um, Windows go out and, and advertise with, hey, this device has better sound quality than the other device, buy my device. And uh, so the hardware in the mobile segment became a lot more complicated than what we saw before with ASOC, uh, became highly specialized and um, when you, for example, have a phone with Android running, um, there is no, there's nothing like Pulse Audio in, in the sense there is one audio demon that takes care of everything. There need to be today um, device specific components in the audio server, sometimes extracted away using configuration files. Um, but it's really not, you cannot take, you cannot create a generic distribution like Debian. Like you can take Debian and run it on your, des uh, on your desktop or your laptop and it works out of the box, but you can't run it on your phone, or at least you won't get audio, because the distribution has to be aware of what the hardware looks like, which is a big problem, um, as we will see in a moment. So now we are in the present, and let's quickly look at the consumer audio stack, how it looks like. And as I said, so. Uh, pretty much everybody is using HDA on board. Some people still use USB, but to a lesser extent, um, in the kernel there's a well-tested HDA driver and a well-tested USB driver, which see lots of updates. Um, on top of that, we have the ALSA library, and Pulse Audio talks to the ALSA library and then through the ALSA library to the devices. And uh, on top of Pulse Audio, we have a couple of different categories of applications. Multimedia application generally, is, generally use uh, GStreamer um, for their audio library. Then there's some desktop applications which either use libcanberra for notifications like, uh, like a Bing or something like this, like when you get a new message. And if they want to do direct playback, they typically use libpuls. And uh, in the last section, there are games which typically use the SDL library. So you, you sometimes see very convoluted graphs of what the audio stack on Linux looks like. But, um, and of course those graphs are correct, but in reality uh, it looks more like this and everything else is an exception. Um, yeah, I think we covered it. Yeah, there's a small, small niche uh, for professional and prosumer audio and this is mostly Firewire based, but everything else uses either HDA or USB. And, uh, all the Pulse Audio issues have basically been solved today. And Pulse Audio is also aware of HDA and USB, has special code to take care of those two uh, drivers and devices, knows what to do when you have an HDA card or a USB card plugged in. And uh, if you want to go more in the professional audio world, there's a Jack Audio server. Um, and Pulse Audio and Jack also know about each other and uh, they don't fight over the sound card, but there's a protocol where they can negotiate usage of the sound card. Like Pulse Audio will give up the sound card when Jack wants to use it and vice versa. So it's, it's all very well handled. And, um, but at the same time, embedded has changed a lot, has become a lot more convoluted. Um, we typically have DSPs now on, on the SOC that does a lot of signal processing. It's not, no longer just one codec, it's multiple codecs, auxiliary codecs, you have amplifiers. Uh, lots of inputs, outputs, um, there's Bluetooth which wants audio support so you can like talk on your Bluetooth headset, uh, the modem so you can have voice calls while shutting every, so the modem is typically directly connected to the codec so you can send, shut down the SSC um, to reduce power while having a call. Um, and uh, this is also reflected in, in, in where the development happened. Um, if we look at uh, the last five years, Audio in total saw around 14,700 commits. Uh, 500 of those were for the ALSA core, so it's more or less stable, not so much going on. Uh, 2,100 were for the HDA. And all the other PCI devices we have with support for combined only was 500. 
and each of them were like 20 to 100. And you have to consider that a lot of those patches are actually auto-generated cleanup patches. So uh, we can pre pretty much say everything else here is like the other PCI devices are, there's no development going on, they're probably not in use. And then we have USB, the 600 patches, which is also pretty good, uh, which is the second most developed platform after HDA. And then again, the Firewire drive is 300 in total and 10 to 80 each one. And then there's, of course, ASOC, which has about two thirds of the total commit count. So embedded takes up two thirds of the total commit count of the upstream kernel. And what it's not reflected here is that there are many, many more drivers outside of mainline which are uh, not included. And, and the split in ASOC is roughly 50-50 between codecs and host drivers. And of course, there are some platforms which are haven't seen many updates in the last five years because they have become outdated. But there is not like on the desktop side one system which takes them all, but there are roughly, I don't know, five or six or seven platforms which each have a similar commit count to like USB and uh, under active development. So it's a much, much more spread out there. So um, now let's look at the future, what's, what's lying ahead of us. and. Um, yeah, the next transition, and uh, it really has already started uh, one or two years ago. And uh, what happened is that the concepts that have been pioneered in the mobile world are now applied to all power power, battery-powered devices, and those devices are already shipping right now. And, and the reason why this is done is because power has become such a differentiating feature. People are no longer happy with three or four hours of battery runtime, but want 10 hours, 12 hours. And at the same time, they want to watch movies while getting this runtime and listen to audio. And um, another thing that happened in the last couple of years, last 10 years maybe, silicon has become a lot, lot, lot cheaper to produce. So what happens is that features that we at some point moved from hardware to software to save cost are now moved back to hardware to uh, save power. So in a sense, we have uh, come full circle in, 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 in this case. So the hardware is now again implementing synthesizers, mixing, DSP for audio quality improvement and so on. So how are we keeping up with this? Um, and I just want to introduce a few technologies that have been developed over the last couple of years uh, to handle this. Uh, and, and some ideas that are floating around which might be used to improve this. One is the use case manager, um, which, because as I said, those codecs have become a lot more complex. They Im implement a lot of controls. None of the controls follow the standard naming schemes anymore, so a sound server doesn't really know what to do with those controls. And the use case manager allows to write configuration files which group the control settings by function uh, like, for example, a phone call or hi-fi music. And all the sound server has to do is select a specific profile, and then in the background it will configure things the way it should be for this specific hardware. But of course, this requires writing a configuration file for each device. Um, and, um, yeah. and there are similar concepts. Uh, so use case manager is a, a part of ALSA. And, but there are similar concepts, for example, in Android, and the Android sound server, as well as Pulse Audio, has also the, their own kind of use case manager. And uh, what we should probably try to do is, is unify this at some point, so you, uh, you only have to write those files once, and then users can choose which distribution they want to install and which sound servers they want to run. Um, the other thing that has been under development is uh, ASA topology which is basically a firmware that's provided by user space, which is describing how the different things are interconnected. Uh, so stuff that, for example, for HDA comes out of the BIOS, for topology comes out of uh, the topology file. And it was in initially uh, intended to just describe flow graph of a DSP firmware because there's a lot of processing going on in DSPs these days. And we want to know if we insert audio in one side of the DSP stream, uh, yeah, inside the DSP, where is it coming out on the other side? Um, but it was uh, slowly extended to really also cover the hardware description. Um, 
But one of the issues with topology is it has become very dependent on uh, the internals of ASOC. So basically directly exports the internals of ASOC. And we already said that um, uh, the, the, this model of platform CPU DOI and codec no longer really applies to the current hardware configuration, um, which makes things a bit more complicated because it would be really great to clean this up, but topology has basically now made this ABI, uh, which means it needs to stay around forever well, or for a longer time. So what does it mean? Should we just like, is it time for a major overhaul? Should we just like throw it all away? Maybe go back to OSS? because uh, there's OSS 4 now, which is open source again, um, or maybe use a different solution, right, from something from scratch. And uh, sometimes you hear demands from people who say, yeah, this also is all, impulse audio is all crap, we need to replace it. Uh, but I disagree with this assessment. I think also impulse audio is a really great base, um, but they have, or at least also has been around for 18 years. and. Um, there's simply things that happened that nobody could anticipate 18 years ago, and uh, so it's maybe time, time for upgrade um, to to make sure that we can can handle the things that have happened in the hardware landscape in the past. Because uh, the core concept of ISA, I think, are really good. Um, the idea of uh, exposing the raw hardware capabilities allows us to extract the maximum, and then on top of this, build layers that simplify things. Um, one thing I think we probably should do is extend the component model, because currently ASOC uh, flattens the component tree. Everything that's exported to user space is just one sound card. A user space is no longer aware of the different components that are present in the system, which makes it really difficult to identify which component takes care of which function, because you don't know which components are present, so you don't know uh, which functions those components can take care of. Um, so I personally think we should make the components a top-level uh, concept in ALSA and then allow applications to discover the topology. And um, the, re cause the reality really is that most, most future sound cards will use ASOC because, as I said, the hardware has changed um, the way the hardware is built is changed, it's really made up of different, lots of different components, and we don't want to create a monolithic driver, uh, or many monolithic drivers, which then each have this kind of the same code. So you probably also make ASOC a first level citizen inside ALSA. Um, and the other thing is, um, we need to really get rid of this platform CPU DOI codec concept and replace it with something else, and I think what's a good idea is, uh, introduce kind of like a domain bridge model. Um, a domain has a certain set of parameters because the way it currently is, everything runs with the same set of parameters. If you configure your playback stream for 48k playback, every other component in the system will think that it's running at 48k, uh, even though there might be sample rate converters in the system. So something where you split things up into multiple domains works a lot better to handle this. Um, yeah, and we probably should remove, completely remove the uh, distinction between different component types because lots of functions that were typically in the past implemented on the codec side are now also implemented on the host side. Some system, like the example over here, don't even have a codec. Everything is done inside uh, the SOC. There's just a simple audio controller with a DAC and an ADC directly connected to a DMA. And the last thing that people always talk about is uh, exporting the audio flow graph. Because there are many controls, lots of mixing going on, many, many volume controls. And at the moment, uh, audio servers and applications don't really know which control controls what. Um, and exporting this flow graph, for example, in this case, there's a PCM device going to a DAC and then to a speaker. And there's a digital attenuator over here on this path and the gain control over here on this path. And exporting this information um, allows the sound server to be aware of that if they make a change here, it will affect the path, and if they make a change here, it will also affect the path. And typically, for example, you first want to max out or minimize the digital attenuation before you start uh, increasing the gain um, to minimize the noise that's introduced. And yeah, so summary, um, it's not really a happy end. 
Um, we are for sure at the end of a golden era. Things are changing. Uh, the hardware has already gone through the next transition and uh, from the software side we haven't really kept up. And the next few years will be rough. I'm pretty sure there are a few people here in the audience who have bought a laptop recently who is simply not working. And um, hopefully, hopefully this will uh, become a bit more of a pain point for people. So, um, and if we implement those, those ideas, um, I'm confident that we can solve it and maybe in five years again everything will be good and everything will work out of the box again. But the next one or two years it will be difficult. So uh, with this, thanks for your attention. And uh, we have a little room, I think, for Q&A, like 10 minutes. Anybody, any questions? Okay. Uh, if I understand correctly, until now, everything about the, the sound configuration is inside the kernel, isn't it? So you don't have anything about what happens, for example, in Android, that you have an XML file that describes the various connection. But this is something that we are going, we are going to, to, to do in the future. Yes, yeah, so, so the use case manager is the same concept as the XML files in Android. Okay. So this is already implemented in yeah. ASA, in user space. Oh, it's already implemented in yeah, ASA? Yeah, it's, it's in the user space, it's not in the okay. kernel. So you, you, but it's not very widespread, it hasn't been adopted really yet. And do you think that this will be the final solution or is it going to be moving inside the kernel again so you don't have dependency is on what is described inside the root file system because you have usually the, the device is better if it's described completely in the kernel or in device tree or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's true. Um, so yeah, I think device tree and ACP are one part of the solution, but those descriptions are not always complete. Especially with ACPI, we can't really fix this because it's well the way it ships. It is in the hardware, and we can't upgrade it. So we need to supply augmenting information from user space. The, the bulk of the HDA drivers in the kernel by lines of code is probably quirks for BIOSes that lie. Uh, <clears throat> on the topic of, of uh, sound server wars, so do you know what was the motivation of, of development of sound servers and not just having an extension of ALSA user space for mixers and synthesizers? Yeah, I think during that time ALSA went through a period where it did not have that much development. So ideally the sound server it itself would be included in the ALSA distribution, would be a component of ALSA. Uh, but to be honest, these days I think Pulse Audio can be counted as the, into the extended family of ALSA because Pulse Audio developers talk to ALSA developers, Pulse Audio requirements drive changes in the ALSA framework, so it has become more or less part of ALSA. Um, one general question, uh, can, can you comment on how, you, um, how much support you get from, from the vendors um, when they introduce a new device, um, do they push, uh, um, push patches um, by themselves or uh, do they give access to the um, documentation? What's the state um, currently there? Um, uh, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So, um, <laughs> now you say there are lots of vendors or some, well, some vendors are actively participating upstream, um, sending patches. It's, it's, these days it's really hard to actually get documentation because it's all proprietary, everything under NDA. Um, so we are a bit reliant on vendors actually sending the patches. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that in, in, ge in general, silicon vendors are doing a moderately good job, varies with the silicon vendor, system integrators less. 
Yeah, so it's yes, yeah, it's, it's really all dependent on because uh, like if you make a if you make a device, you would expect the device maker to supply a patch for their device, right? But uh, well, the only ones supplying patches are really the chip makers at the moment. Hello, I have a question. Um, I would like to know if the use case manager would be something similar to, for instance, the Genevi audio manager, where you can set rules to high-level applications behavior in a more or less easy way with config files, like set the behavior of a source connecting to a particular thing, so, lowering sorry, the, the level. What, what audio? What? Genevi audio manager. I, sorry, I don't know it. OK. Um, yeah. But but the, probably probably can, can you describe a bit how the then the use case manager would work? Or yeah, so the usage of it? well the Thanks. the use case manager uh, in in general is just a, a library, so it's not an application, and any sound server that wants to implement this kind of function can use the use case manager library to. You, you, in the use, you have configuration files in which you describe typical use cases for your audio hardware, which contains control settings, mixer setting, routing settings, specific to this configuration. And, and the idea is to provide a common base platform. So it's more oriented to the hardware, not to the high-level applications behavior? Yes, yes. Okay. It's definitely Thanks. on the hardware level. Any additional questions? Yes, one over here. I have a question more for the embedded use case. Uh, there, you said that uh, basically hardware vendors, they are system integrators, they don't provide patches. But, uh, well, I'm one of those that actually try to provide some patches and I then got confronted with this simple card stuff. Mm -hmm. and, but it's kind of limited. What is the status there? Mark, do you want to take this? Um, so Morimoto Sans uh, actually at this conference. I don't know if I don't see him in this room, but um, yeah. So simple card is intentionally simple. So if you're if it's too limited for you, there's a reasonable chance that you might just have. Uh, it might be actually a good idea to write your own machine driver, but you're likely to have got the pushback. Do you need to do? Uh, can you use this? But it's perfectly possible that the answer is uh, no. I can't use this. I need to do something more complicated. So um, yeah, it's it's there, and a lot of people should use it, but that doesn't mean everybody has to use it. One over there. <clears throat> Maybe this is a bit of a noob question, but uh, can you comment on, uh, say some words on uh, ALSA on Android and how that compares to uh, ALSA upstream? Like, do they use the newest version? Is there some kind of like uh, the use case manager on mm -hmm. Android? Is that go back to upstream, or is there some kind yeah, of integration so, going on? Uh, when it comes to the ALSA core, it's uh, often, the ALSA core is usually unchanged in the distributions, um, but there are a lot of hardware vendors which are still out of mainline, so there are lots of additional drivers. Some of these um, vendors also have introduced changes to ASOC uh, because they required it, but um, the thing is, ASOC, of course, upstream is also going through an evolution, through changes. So there's a bit of a divergence uh, in terms of what the vendors are shipping and what's upstream. And the longer it takes to, for them to get the code upstream, the larger the divergence will be. Um, but yeah, so and regarding the question to use case manager, yes, the uh, Android uh, audio server implements something very similar. Um, the, the reason Android doesn't use um, upstream ALSA user space is that Android has a strong desire to ship all um, Apache uh, BSD-style license code, and all the ALSA user space code is GPL or LGPL. So um, they went and re-implemented uh, re it uh, for that reason. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much.